Hey, everybody. Before we begin, uh, I wanted to bring your attention to a GoFundMe page for somebody I happen to know. Um, as you may have guessed with this podcast, it is a passion project. Um, everybody involved on the show here would love for it to be something that pays the bills for each and every one of us one day. And we are all working our hardest to get to that point with the realization, of course, that with the amount of podcasts out there, of course, who knows what can happen, but you don't know what you can reach till you, till you can get it. But long story short, this is a passion project. I have a nine to five job. And with that nine to five job, you happen to meet people. Some become friends, some become trusted coworkers. You know, you don't necessarily have a connection with them, but when you, when you work with them, you know, you're working with someone who's a very good person, someone that, you know, their work ethic you want to emulate. And, um, this person, um, who's now a former coworker, uh, Rachel Haig, uh, had a pretty severe accident happen, uh, uh, the other day here. She, uh, accidentally, uh, lacerated her left hand across her palm, straight through the muscle, right down to the bone. Um, she is looking at physical therapy more than likely she's looking at a uh, surgery and hopefully she's not looking at uh, any sort of nerve damage that could uh, d- that could permanently uh, keep her from using parts or all of that uh, hand um, as a writer myself if one of my hands went down for the count forever that would severely hamper what I could do uh, as a writer so I definitely I definitely feel for her. I definitely feel bad for her. But uh, like I mentioned, she does have a GoFundMe page. I definitely recommend every single last listener of the show go to. Uh, go to GoFundMe.com slash Rachel Haig. That's R-A-C-H-A-E-L-H-A-I-G-H. And contribute what you can. Every little bit counts. Counselor Troy, are you getting any telepathic impressions from that spatial anomaly? I'm sensing... Someone tying me down to a bed? Oh, uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, probably nothing. We should uh, probably just uh, change course. A man in a nipple bra and crotchless panties? Oh, uh, 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 Data, uh, how, how are you coming on in your quest to understand humans? He's pouring lemonade on my face. Uh, Jordy, uh, uh, Jordy, how much, um, uh, how much uh, gas? Uh, do we have? Um, are we, uh, good on, uh, gas? Wait a minute, that's not lemonade! I'll be in my ready room! If your friends are nerdy and you are nerdy So we will move on to the next Star Trek TV show, one of their best efforts. Uh, You know, the first time that Star Trek as a television show, uh, you know, played around with a serialized storyline. Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Thoughts? Yeah. Well, the fact how how the show got started, right? Cisco and his wife and his kid are on a ship that's being that's going down, and they have to get they have to get off the ship. And I think what's interesting about that is we find out who the ship had. To, I think I believe the ship had to be destroyed. If I'm if I'm correct. Yeah, it was the it was the battle uh, from the best of both worlds. Right. So, and the fact, and who was responsible for that? That was Picard. So we so if a fan, as being a fan of the show, you start to realize Benjamin Sisko's hatred. Also, he's taking care. He's taking over this ship, DS Nine, that's in the middle of I think in in uh, Alpha in one of the quadrants. We know, you know, dealing with dealing with the Kardashians and with the Bajorans after this major <laughs> war battle. Not, not the Kardashians. No, oh, yeah, that. Whoa, that's pretty slip. Sorry, the, that's the Kardashians. I did say Kardashians. I meant the um, Kardashians. Uh, uh, thank you, Kardashians. Card- they're, they're both the same, annoying, but always, always around. With with, with ridges on their face. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. So, I mean, just that. But for me, like I said earlier. Hawking out of space, and Avery <laughs> Brooks, who is an incredible actor, the presence for, for playing this 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 character and bringing these also with like with, with any star, uh, you know, Trek series diversification. We know we, we have we have a Ferengi bartender, you know. We have we have this you know we have Odo this this shapeshifter who's been on it, who's been on it for a long time, you know, who's who's, who's just this commander. 
that you know that's been run, that's been as as the station's been taken over by different you know factions. He's been there, you know, council for forever. We learn more about his his, his role. Then you have the episode that we told earlier with the triple, with them going back in time dealing with the tribbles. I mean, that itself was a major callback. Yeah. And I love little things too, like you know, we brought up Quark. That you know, that yeah. show really helped kind of flesh out the uh, the Ferengis as as, as a race. Because pre- you know, when they first came about, you know, Gene Roddenberry initially wanted the Ferengi to be these this big, bad, ferocious bad guys that the that the you know that, that Starfleet has to battle, but. When you see them, you don't think scary. You want to laugh. That you think humorous. So I'm glad that they kind of fleshed out those characters. I absolutely loved Wallace Shawn as the Grand Negan Zet. Oh, he was so good. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the episodes with him and Cork's mother were great. Another unsung hero of that show, actress Louise Fletcher, who played a Bajoran prophet. Louise, yeah. Louise Fletcher, for folks that don't know, you should go out and watch the movie uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. She's Nurse Ratched. She has the apps. She has this way of just being the most evil person while never raising her voice and always smiling. You just, it's, it's, what was that a uh, teacher? Dolores Umbridge. Yeah, that's exactly name. who I was thinking of. Yeah, yes. she just yeah. <laughs> the same type of mentality every time oh, she was on. That made that, that yeah, that made that show um, amazing to watch. Uh, Major Kira, she she was great on the show. Um, Doctor Bashir, you find out that Doctor Bashir is um, a, a relative of Khan. Mm-hmm. You know, he's wow, yeah. he's one of the ones that uh, genetically are uh, um, genetically enhanced humans. Um, and also, too, when uh, Deep Space Nine went into the mirror universe, they kind of hinted that o- uh, O'Brien and Bashir, who were friends on the show in the mirror universe, they they briefly hinted that may have, that they may have been more than friends. Oh wow! Okay, I watch it again. It's been a minute. Romance, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. And then Rom and Nog, I, I love the Nog. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he he was great on the show. Jake Sisko uh, was great on the show. I mean, just an overall great show. It, I, and I love the fact that you know they they, they actually had conflict in this show because one of uh, Gene Roddenberry's um, directives with the Next Generation really put a hamper on the types of stories you could tell was that these people had no conflict. You can't right. have a proper story without some sort of conflict. And Deep Space Nine, they were able to go with the Dominion War. They brought in Odo's race, who turned out to be quite evil. Um, yeah. the, the Cardassians uh, ended up uh, <laughs> reneg Not the Cardassians. Um, <laughs> no, no white Broncos involved there. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, they actually had a major war that affected the entirety of Star Trek. Um, yeah. You know, that tied into Voyager uh, with the, the, the renegade race, the Maquis. Um, that tied into some of the uh, later Star Trek films as well. Uh, you know, but it just they introduced a lot on that show that they didn't really follow up with too much, which which is a darn shame in my opinion. I, it's interesting because I think that you know Deep Space Nine was kind of kind of unique in the Star Trek universe and that it was um, the most sort of. I mean, Voyager had their whole, like, voyage home. However, um, it was still, like, kind of ep- more episode by episode in some ways. But, but Deep Space Nine really was a lot of, like, this, like, we found, you know, this rift to another quadrant and, like, confronting that that threat. Um, but it, it was the most war-hungry sort of Star Trek. And I feel like while it... it it was really interesting, and the characters I think were some of the the best in watching their conflict and their development. And you know, Cisco's whole um, relationship with the Bajorans and being their sort of messiah in some ways, and 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 Odo's relationship with Kira, and all of this, like the relationships and the characters were some of the most complex. Um, but I think that that it, the show itself kind of lost some of the soul of Star Trek a little bit in getting too deep in this war. And it, it wasn't about 
um, like how do we overcome this situation beyond war? It was all about the war itself. And, and I, I think it almost stooped back to some of the unfortunate realism of today's world where like, that's, that's unfortunately the only option that we see to resolve conflict is to go to war. Um, and I, I think it reinforced that rather than, than continuing to show us like there's another way out. There's another way, uh, to, to be, uh, to interact with each other rather than just fighting about it. And, and I think it, it allowed that complexity and the kind of like, you know, you saw some of the first like, maybe could go evil, you know, main Star Trek characters, um, of the primary cast. But I think it, it lost that hope that kind of had, had held the rest of Star Trek together. I get that. And I I do think that they could have spent a few more episodes near the end of the series, kind of building that hope back up. Um, You know, Cisco ultimately uh, becomes one with the Bajoran gods in the wormhole at at the end, um, which ultimately helps end the the Dominion War and, you know, saves everybody. Um, But it's... Yeah. You know, it was important to add that conflict on there. But, you know, I think it's, you know, to speak to something we'll talk about in a bit with Star Trek Discovery, sometimes if you go too far in one direction, you're going to turn off uh, uh, other fans of the series. You do. It is a bit of a tightrope walk. True. But, uh, you know, oh, we've got to mention Dax, but also when Worf came through, with the Defiant, that also changed the, 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 the arc of the show as well. So you had an old, fa- you had an old favorite coming back. You know, in with, with with that as well. So that was kind of a nice little spark about it. But I, I you know, I, 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 so I think you're right. You know, there, it, it it was a lot. This is also the first uh, show that that was not produced by Rodney since Rodney had died during the middle of Next Generation. So Rick Berman had took, was taking over the reins of this. So the expandability option was there for that. And I, I remember catching it in college. I dated myself there for the show. There was, <laughs> I said, it, it's. You know, there was some aspects of it. It was like, all right, yeah, but you know, what would, you know, think about think a time. What else? What else? What, what stuff was also on television? X Files was on as well, right? So you had, you know, you, you had you had other sci-fi shows out at that time. So it made it more expandable. And then and in the '90s, you had all these series really reaching out for you know diverse or types of storytelling. You know, you know, and think about like a couple of years ago, you know, Battlestar Galactica got remade. So. Mm-hmm. One thing, uh, t- too, I'm glad you brought up uh, uh, other shows in the 90s. Um, there was a person by the name of J. Michael Straczynski who created a show called Babylon 5. And what he did before he went to, I believe it was Warner Brothers, he went to Paramount. And uh, for a show like Babylon 5, you do got to create what's called a series Bible, which gives you a basic introduction of the characters, the world they live in, the places they're going to frequent. He showed the, 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 peop- the people at Paramount the series Bible, and they ultimately passed on Babylon 5. But they took a lot of those same elements from that series Bible that, uh, that uh, Babylon 5 had, and, and it, 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 J. Michael Straczynski is convinced that Deep Space Nine would not be around because, you know, Paramount stole it from him. Wow. Both, both claims. Both yeah. Claims. All right, so we are going to go on. The next movie is the first time we saw the Next Generation crew in a movie, but it was also the last time we saw any of the old, uh, the, the original series crew on, on screen as well. That was Star Trek Generations. To me, that movie was... That only purpose of that movie was to get uh, Picard and Kirk together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That movie had a lot of flaws. Um, you know, I think of uh, there's a, a great uh, company, Red Letter Media, um, and they uh, review movies. And a lot of the a lot of the reviews you can find on YouTube and everything, but um, they do it with a, with a character, Mister Plinkett. And Mr. Plinkett um, reviewed Generations, and he talked about little things like uh, where near the end of the movie where the Enterprise has crashed and, you know, Picard's going through his uh, old office and he takes this statue and just tosses it aside. He pointed out that that statue was, um, you know, in a previous episode of the series, given to him by his old archaeology professor and that he treasured it. 
And yet in the movie, he's just tossing it aside like it was a paper cup on the ground. And just little thing, little, I think the big problems I have with the Next Generation movies is, is that they went so far away from what the core concept of uh, the Next Generation was that it made it almost unrecognizable. I mean, little things like, uh, I think this is around the time where uh, Counselor Troy started losing her unique accent and just started talking like Marina Sirtis. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Generations. Yeah, you know, I mean, it. Uh, weird plot, but um, you know, Malcolm McDowell. You know, you got that. You, it 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 segues way in, but I think you're right. It, it just was a way to, to 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 give a Kirk just a little more screen time. Little mm-hmm. more screen time. <laughs> yeah, squeeze that cash time. cow just a little bit. <laughs> but it but it was also good seeing um, Patrick Stewart on a big screen again. Uh, I, you know, Pat, you know, we kind of forget, you know, we, we talk about next generation with the actors. We got to, you know, Patrick Stewart has the chops. Uh, definitely, uh, Google I Claudius, the BBC series that, that aired. He, he flips it as that. He was also in Dune. And he's been, he's been around for a while. And I think for those of us who are fans of next generation, you know, Picard was, was kind of like the new gold standard, a separate standard from Kirk, where Kirk was much more, of uh, this uh, suave, debonair kind of dude, Jean-Luc was more introspective, more reflective. You know, he it, it was more, uh, it, he saw, you know, it, the decisions he made or things of that nature, and Stuart brought that gravitas to it. Uh, during an interview with Howard Stern a couple of years ago, he talked about how, you know, when he first did it, he didn't think the show would be picked up. The first season of the show, he had no idea what, you know, he, he didn't understand the, the capacity of Trekkies, of devoted star, you know, you know, Star Trek fans, that the show had so much gravitas. He was like, "Wow, I, this is something pretty big." And you know, like I said, it, it he it launched and you know, doing the conventions launched into a whole new orbit. And like I said, for those of us who watched, grew up on Next Generation, it was like that. It was kind of like we knew the old school of Kurt, but with with John Luke, it was a different mix. Also, with stuff, the Next Generation. More diverse, yeah. You know, things. You know, we're, we're seeing. You know, more 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 characters of color. You know, women doing do different roles. Michelle, you know, young. I forgot her name. Michelle Phillips' character when she was on. Anson Rowe. Star Trek. Anson Rowe, mm-hmm. exactly like that. So we're starting to see that happening with that. So with generations, I think it was just that setup because we know after generations came, then came the film that really was like, this is what um, that you know we're, we're not we know we're not value right now. But it's that setting up when we get to that peak for next for next thing happening. But for me, I kind of agree, dude. I was kind of like generations as like, eh, you know, it is what it is. You know, you know, Kirk dies, so some part of part of us are kind of like, uh, uh, you know, it finally happens. <laughs> but it just it just moves it. Like I said, it the whole idea of these is moving it to the next segment. That that and when we know what's coming, that's when like, okay, here we go. It was it was it was worth going through this just for that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think it was. Like, the plot, eh. Um, <laughs> it, it was just kind of all over the place. But I think it was, you know, kind of like a, a passing of the torch of, like, okay, like, the Federation and Star Trek has grown beyond the, like, kind of Wild West, sort of, the, the original was a little bit, and and developed and refined, and, and now, like, the mantle is being passed, and that's okay, and so it, it was kind of nice for that, but it, it the, and that, you know, I love seeing all of them, yeah, on the screen again, and Picard especially, like, I just, oh, John Luke, um, <laughs> but, uh, it, the movie itself as a movie was not terribly impressive. One good thing about that movie, though, uh, William Shatner, in one of his memoirs, uh, writes <laughs> about the fact that, you know, when he met Patrick Stewart, Patrick Stewart was probably the first person that got him to really appreciate Star Trek. In the past, he just saw it as a role. He was glad he was able to make some money off of it, but... He wasn't a huge Star Trek fan until Patrick Stewart came along and, you know, had that, you know, gravitas that you both mentioned and uh, made him really have more appreciation for, you know, overall, not only what his character and his involvement in the show did, but just what that show has been able to accomplish with everybody. So if it, if it brought out something positive like that, then, hey, can't go wrong there. But 
Let's move on to the next uh, one. That would be uh, uh, another TV show. Um, Paramount decided to come out with a network, UPN, and Mm -hmm. um, similar to what they tried to do in the 70s, they had a Star Trek show be the cornerstone of that network. That was Star Trek Voyager. We've already touched upon it a little bit, but overall, thoughts? I Voyager, again, was was interesting because it was, you know, in isolation of the Federation that the whole um, show took place. Um, they, you know, got transported to this other galaxy and, and were kind of trying to figure out, like, is the Prime Directive valid here? Like, what 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 values can we follow, you, follow when we're in this, like, very extreme situation? And how do we hold on to ourselves and what we all came here for and adapt. Um, and so it was kind of interesting to see the, the Star Trek uh, mentality in a different setting. Um, I thought it was kind of weaker characters um, than, than there had been before. Like, I, I thought the Doctor was great. Uh, Janeway, I gained an appreciation for, and and Tuvok as well. I thought he he kind of had some more interesting moments, but a lot of the other characters were just a little bit. I don't know. They were kind yeah, of- I, 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 I agree with you. Like you know, like like Kim kind of got annoying for for a while, and Chakotay were was still trying to figure out. But um, <clears throat> I thought Juliana. You know, the half Klingon, half human engineer. That was that was kind of nice. Uh, for me, I never got into that show. Um, I, I know in, on an earlier episode, I gave Sterling crap for liking Janeway. Um, but, mm. it, 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 you know, for when it came out, if that was his Star Trek, then that was his Star Trek, you know. Um, he's already had enough with my son calling him a poopy head, so we'll leave it uh. at that. But, um, <laughs> which you can hear in episode 25. Um, anyway, I, to me, I think that's when Star Trek fatigues first started hitting. Because you got when Voyager first came out, that was ninety six. That was nine years of consistent Star Trek at that point. You know, we had the Next Generation, which finished in ninety four. We had Deep Space Nine, which started in ninety three. We had all the movies in between, and at that point, I, I just didn't care for this new group of assembled people. Um, so, have I really given that show the chance it deserves? I haven't, but I, I just. It, the, you know, there's nothing stopping me from watching it now, but I, I just don't watch it. It just never really caught my interest. It was the first series that I didn't finish when it came out. Um, but then a year or two ago, I went through and rewatched everything start to finish. <laughs> um, although not all the movies, for some reason, they seem kind of separate to me. But, um, but I, I made myself finish Voyager. And I, you know, I was glad that I did once I had, and again, it was, it was one of those things where I, it was interesting to see how much my relationship as a woman and my perspective of Janeway changed. And I really, like, I appreciated her style of command a lot more, um, and the way that she interacted with the crew, um, and her relationship with Seven of Nine was interesting. That was kind of weird. Did you get that far, Tim? No. Yeah, uh, no. I mean, that was also the time where The Rock had a, a guest appearance in the show as well. But um, um, oh, I, I remember that. I yeah. Remember that. Um, for for me though, that does raise an interesting question. Um, I was speaking with uh, Ray earlier, um, and uh, Ray mentioned that there are some people today that are horrible human beings, and they're racist, they're sexist, and yet they try and mask it in other ways. And you know, those fans when it comes to Star Trek, will commonly say that Deep Space Nine and Voyager are the worst. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but I, I uh, what do you all think about that? I mean, how, how do you think... Uh, well, I, I think if, if we look, if... All right, let's just, let's call, let's call it what it is, right? If we're talking purely written, written material about it, there were some parts of both shows that had issues. But you know, it's any for any sci-fi show. But I think I like both of them because of the diverse. Because it it's something different. Sometimes you know, I, I think what Burn was trying to do was take the show stick was taking the show in different directions because it needed to. That you know, there needed to be a change 
in, in Star Trek. You can't, you, you know, it, the, the fact that the series has been going on for over 50, 60 years making money means that it's working. We're in a new realm, a new age right now. And yeah, there were some parts of, of aspects of it. You know, when Q had to make an appearance on um, on Voyager, we were we were kind of happy about it. But we were like, you know, oh, you know, I guess it's a it's obligatory if we're going to be dealing in the Star Trek uh, environment. And Q is one of the most loved characters, and he is and he is he is everywhere. That would kind of make sense. You know, I we, we talk about him. We talk about him coming up in um, when DS Nine came up, and how like Cisco just popped him in his mouth, and he said, "The car never hit me." He goes, "I'm not the car." You know, mm-hmm. one of the few times he's like, all right, I'm not going to come back here anymore. Because he's like, we don't got time for that. Yeah. But I think with Voyager, there are some aspects of it that I think were fascinating. Technically, the ship, Voyager ship itself was a smaller, faster ship, which is kind of nice. They During that series, they found a way to kill the Borg for that, which I found fascinating. They went more to the Borg on with that. And understanding, when, you know, when 79 came on, which I liked, because it added a different change to the crew. We got to understand more about her, but also more about the Borg itself. And I think that, you know, that's a good aspect of Star Trek I like. Because now we're getting to understand about these characters that are really dominant. <clears throat> Excuse me. But also, you know, it, it happens. You know, it, it, it's... I think what, it was only five seasons, Tim? Uh, seven. 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 See, seven seasons. So for... I mean, nowadays, you know, hey, it's in syndication on B- I think BBC America has been showing it. BBC America for the past... I think uh, two, by past year and a half, Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation, Voyager. So it's being some of class over the planet. So there's still it, there's still a need, for, you know, a, a love of those um, episodes. I, the one thing that always annoyed me about Voyager, though, was that ship never had battle scars. That ship near the end should have been in tatters. You should have seen uh, parts of it should have been broken. You know, if if they had uh, the Enterprise and the Next Generation have a problem uh, like that, uh, the Borg when they uh, cut a piece of the Enterprise out, they immediately went to a starbase and got that fixed. Whereas the Voyager ship did not have that luxury because they were so far away from space. Yet you look at all seven seasons, that ship on the outside is pristine. That always annoyed me. A little nitpick from me. <laughs> but all right, so we'll move on to Star Trek: First Contact, where the Borg can go back in time and try to uh, interrupt Zephram Cochran, as played by the great James Con- Cromwell, from achieving warp drive. Thoughts on that movie? I I actually I liked that one. I thought um, it was kind of neat to see. Uh, you know what where humanity was at when we first attained the stars you know and kind of what what they were dealing with and what people were like and it's you know it's a lot more kind of like real of what it is today and and um the imperfections but the excitement um and uh and then also getting to see you know the cast of the next generation trying to adapt to what the world was like then and I, I think there was a moment when Cochran's, you know, wasted and Jordy's like, you gotta, what are you doing? Like, you gotta stay on task and kind of that, um, that confrontation of, of how humans cope, cope now and, and kind of where his, uh, his discovery, his invention allowed humans to go in the future, um, that, you know, Final Frontier, the New Horizon. Yeah, yeah, I like, I <laughs> yeah, I, I like that too. But I think this, it, I mean, that it's it starts. I mean, we finally get the origin of how of, of how you know, <clears throat> you know, the, the enterprise, you know, how the Federation got started. But I also like the fact is that you have that Borg aspect again. So you have this, so while it was happening going on on the planet, you, you know, the crew trying to recreate the fry, flight, you have stuff going on up, you know, in, uh, in on, on the ship, you know. Yet again, Data, we see, plays a part. Oh, wow, we forgot to mention the fact that his emotional ship in Generations is ter- is, 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 is activated. Per- oh, and I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm calling you, Meredith. You know, you, you're the, uh, you know, you know, you know Data. I was, I was like, you know, for Meredith, we can't bring that one out there. But uh, with that, but yeah, we saw about that. And also the fact that 
data starts getting like I guess that human sensation, uh, the uh, the Borg queen and play, you know starts growing, uh, you know like hair or stuff on them, or the fact of how the Borg starts taking over the ship, right? Slowly and slowly, the ship gets warmer and warmer. People checking them out, and no one's coming back. So. I always had a problem with that movie because of how Starfleet treated Picard. Picard had a long history of dealing with the Borg. He was captured by them, made into a Borg, and he was rescued. And yet Starfleet made the bonehead stupid decision that the one guy, the one captain on our premier starship who has the most experience with the Borg, we suddenly can't trust him and he can't be involved. How did that make any sort of sense? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because the, there are a lot of moments, I feel like, in The Next Generation, and, and this was kind of true in this movie, where you kind of get the, um, the sense of Federation leadership being kind of out of touch and stuck in their ways at times. Um, and how it really, it kind of was up to the, the captains, the people actually out there to kind of set the record straight for them. And I think that's a, that's a great example of it, of them being like stupid and not, not trusting, you know, Picard, who's, you know, one of the most integrity, integrity, what's the adjective form of that, um, people that they could possibly have called upon and yeah, had the experience and had the the insider knowledge. Um, so yeah, that, that is a frustrating aspect, but, um, yeah. 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 What can you yeah. Do? <laughs> Any final thoughts? No, I think, I, I, I think that, that covered for the generations. It also really gave us a chance to, to, it, it, it sells the fact that the new, you know, the next generation crew is going to be the crew that's going to start, you know, you know, running the films because of the success of that. So that's, it, in some ways, that, that's a good thing. All right. So we'll move on then to the second to worst Star Trek film ever made, Star Trek Insurrection. Actually, the third worst. The second worst would be Nemesis. But uh, Insurrection with a F. Murray Abraham with the skin stretching and all that, I, it just felt like a very bad episode of the show. And there were just you know, points where logic was not applied to the story. I just was not a fan of this uh, movie at all. I have no recollection of this film whatsoever. <laughs> I, 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 you're a senator. I, I have no recollection of this film whatsoever. <laughs> you plead the fifth. <laughs> um, I plead the fifth, yes. Yeah. yeah it's it, directed by Jonathan Frakes. Yeah. <laughs> Frank's like directed first contact, so first contact was cool. Yeah, and then this one was not. So, yeah, garbage movie. You don't. We're in the valley, I'm telling you, we're in the valley. We're oh, the valley. we're going to be in the valley for a very long time because coming up next, Star Trek Enterprise. That's not Star Trek. <laughs> How do you really feel about it? Um, <laughs> I, I, to me, this is where Star Trek fatigue really, really hit. They yeah. they had they had that horrible horrible theme song. Uh, they I, I forgot the I think they ripped it off from Patch Adams, but it was a Rod Stewart impersonator. Just eh, 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 just eh, <laughs> garbage, garbage, garbage. You was, uh, Scott Bakula was the captain, right? And that's a sh- yeah. Scott Bakula was the captain. It was a shame that. Um, he has the sci-fi cred that, that that could have lasted for a long time. I mean, his work on Quantum Leap alone, um, he, that should have lasted. I love how they had Dean Stockwell play uh, an appearance in one of the early seasons. Um, a little not for Quantum Leap fans, but that show never gelled for me. And, you know, the, the final episode in season four... Um, you know, they were not planning for that show to be canceled because otherwise they would not have had um, the entirety of the series end up being like a holograph um, thing that, that, that Riker was going through uh, based on a previous episode. Just There were just so, so many things yeah. wrong with that. And again, speaking of Troy, Troy in the episode made an appearance, but again, without the Troy accent, without the Troy hair, it's just she just showed up and I'm just doing this. You got to, you know. How do you really feel about that, Sam? Oh, I, if I never see it again, that'll be too soon. Um, <laughs> now we'll move on to the one of the very pits of depth of, of badness that Star Trek had, Star Trek Nemesis, with Tom Hardy as a young Picard. 
who uh, helps defeat the Romul, who uh, kills off some Romulans, but then tries to kill Picard just cause. Little things like they had Tom Hardy uh, pose as a picture of a young Picard, but then Tom Hardy as a young Picard in the picture had a bald head, even though it had already been established in a series that Picard had a full head of hair when he was younger. Because, you know, the writers of the movie apparently thought that the audience was so stupid that they wouldn't think that, you know, Picard, you know, could have had hair at a younger point. Um, it was just an action movie with elderly people, and I didn't need to see it. It missed the point of what the next generation was, of what Star Trek was. And if you listen to some of the behind-the-scenes comments, you know, like, they opened the movie with, like, a dune buggy chase. And they had Picard, talk, you know, in a, in a behind the scenes moment, talk about his love of dune buggies. And they just threw a bunch of stuff in there. And also, the film was a very bad attempt at a remake of Wrath of Khan. I mean, it followed a similar storyline where one of the high, uh, in this case, Data, taking over the Spock role, sacrificing himself for the sake of the crew. There was uh, just, uh, it had potential to be good, but they failed in a bad, bad way. Thoughts? Yep. I watched it once. I haven't watched it since. <laughs> it's it, it's uh it's 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 tough to power through. Mm. I, it really is. I I even I was like, what the? Come on now. Come on, come on, come on. And then data as B four and put in. Sh- um, uh, it's, it's wasted opportunity. Let's let's just move on <laughs> with. The failure of Nemesis with the failure of Enterprise Star Trek was off the air for a while. People people didn't see anything new. So what happened, come 2008-2009, J.J. Abrams comes up with the movie simply called Star Trek. And it was a beautifully made soft reboot. I know there are some people that have problems with it, but the reason I say it's beautifully, beautifully made is this. They took their inspiration from the Next Generation episode called Parallels. That's where Worf somehow time travels into a different version of the Enterprise. And then at the end of the episode, you see hundreds of Enterprises in, in space kind of battling, you know, right, j- just right, talking yeah, about I mean, different parallel universes. I'm right. so glad that, that they drew that inspiration there because they were able to do something new with established characters while respecting the originals the originals that it came for. They didn't do what the Ghostbusters made the horrible mistake on and just say, everything else you knew before, it's gone. And and, and enough cannot be said about the casting. Um because like Chris Pine is Kirk. He did he did not do a William Shatner impression, but he captured the spirit of Kirk. I think all the actors and any yeah, other casting was just so like they all did such a fantastic job of not not just playing the characters, but kind of playing the actors playing the characters. And it was a really nice tribute to the work that like Nimoy and Shatner and and um McCoy DeForest Kelly. DeForest Kelly, like all the work that they did and and the personalities that they cultivated for these characters on the original show and they kind of they didn't just redo it but they they took it and and they like really honored it and stayed kind of true to the spirit while giving it a new a new life and and seeing them young was (laughs) kind of fun you're like oh yeah i could see how you would turn into the you that you turned into you know um so i think i think they all did just a great job um with that, and I was very impressed. I, I was very skeptical going into it, and I walked out very impressed. But I know a lot of people have issues with it, but I, I thought they did a good job. Yeah. I, I liked it. it. I thought it was a great reboot. It needed a refresh take of it. And I think what JJ does well is he's a fan. He's a fan of geek like us and says, let me try it this way. And it worked. I think that that's what I liked about that Star Trek. It really, the casting was good. The fact that you see. Um, uh, I, I'll say more of of of, uh, of Kirk and uh, McCoy getting more tighter is something that's not really talked about in the old Star Trek because during the, when during the first movie times with with, with Shatner and uh, the Forest there was kind of that little relationship between where sometimes Bones would tell Jim, "Listen, man, you know you're effing up. This is ridiculous, you, you know, for that." And then for this in 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 this in the new movie now. You see that really, you see that kind of bond there, and I think that's a really good thing. That's that that we talked about is 
The bond between the main crew always sets the story. So once the once the crew is tight and we're invested in there with them, well, we fall with them. We're, we're, it's it's on. We're with them because that sets the story, everything up for everything else. And for that first Star Trek movie reboot, it does that, you know. And now, now you have this Romulan play like Eric Banya. We see, of course, you know, gotta get you know Leonard Nimoy in there just just as as the original, or can we say maybe the most of all the Star Trek actors and characters, would you would both of you say that Leonard Nimoy Spock's probably the most beloved over uh, William Shatner Kirk? I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but I think him being involved in the reboot movies was the right move to make. I mean, William Shatner at, at the point of when Star Trek came out was involved in game shows, was involved in a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, if you offer William Shatner the right amount of money, he's going to do what you want him to do. Whereas Nimoy was selective. So the fact that Nimoy was on board and so enthusiastic about this movie, I, I think that was a big sign to fans that, you know, you should give this a chance. I think if he was not involved, if they had bought in Chekhov, it would not have been as successful. Um, one thing I absolutely loved was the fleshing out of Uhura. Zoe yes. Saldana was amazing, and longtime Trek fans will know that seeds were planted in the original series. There was a scene in the original series, I forgot the specific episode, but Spock is playing a harp, and Uhura starts singing to him, but then she... She, you know, she's, uh, it's like in the mess hall or something like that, but she's singing to Spock, but she's also playfully flirting with him. Mm. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it, to me, I, you know, I immediately thought of that scene and it, 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 you know, Spock and her being together made sense. Um, the one drawback of the increased involvement of Uhura was that Bones was demoted essentially in terms of importance. You know, Bones uh, in the new reboot movies is not as important as he once was. Well, we'll, we'll get to as as series moves on, we'll we'll start seeing some aspects. But yeah, you're right with that. I, I think I think that's uh, that that's a fair assessment of it. Yeah, I mean, I think Bones wasn't as front and center, but I think that. Like, in order to make the show relevant and, um, and, and to kind of like get rid of some of the old fashioned stuff in, in the original that was a little bit embarrassing, like the treatment of women. Yeah. Um, you know, Yuhura needed to be strong and intelligent and actually have a role rather than just, you know, as, as, um, as, uh, Sigourney Weaver says in Galaxy Quest, you know, like, I repeat what the computer says. That's my one job. <laughs> and, and, you know, that was kind of like, she wasn't, she didn't have that, that, the, you know, the, the xenolinguist, like, she just was underutilized in the original. And they finally, like, gave her the voice um, to, to kind of be an integral part of the, the crew. And I loved the scene early in the film where they first start assigning people uh, their their spots on the ships. And um, mm-hmm. Spock uh, was in control of assigning people, and he assigned her onto another ship. And she goes up to him, she goes, no, I'm on the Enterprise. And he was like, no, uh, you're on... Th-. She said, no, I'm on the Enterprise. I see that you are. <laughs> just, just. Yeah, it, it was good. I mean, for as a, as a, as a Trekkie, Trek fan, I'm saying not Trekkie, because I'd, be, I'd be disrespectful. But <laughs> as, as a fan, no, seriously, you know, there are people, you see Trekkies and Trekkers, you know, you get in knife fights. But I, I think the reboot was nice. It's a nice change. Once in a while, you know, there needs to be that refresh. And I think for Star Trek, it the the fundamentals are set so clearly the reboot was was necessary. Yeah. Now we move on to the next one, Star Trek Into Darkness. So we bring on Benedict Cumberbatch as Khan. I was excited for this movie, and then I saw it. It was a wasted opportunity. And I'll tell you why. Um, Khan, the only reason we are made to believe that Khan is a bad guy is because Leonard Nimoy told us. Khan is given no motivation 
he gave no reason to give the audience an, uh, the idea that he was a bad guy because his people, the the his people that they they captured the Botany Bay early on in in that movie uh, section thirty nine, um, I believe that the clandestine Starfleet uh, group that was first introduced in Deep Space Nine captured the Botany Bay and uh, woke up Khan and forced him to do their dirty work. Right. Otherwise, they would kill the other people in the pod. And there was Khan was not a bad guy in that film. I, I related to him because if, if you know my friends and family were kept like that, would I say no and you know whatever, or would I try, do what I could to save them, even if that mean, meant doing some bad things? And it's just that, and the fact that they tried to, with the advertising, go so far to try to fool audiences into thinking that he was not Khan. Uh, that it was just a failure in a lot of levels. And I, I like Carmack's uh, performance as as Khan was cut, was was um, was nice. It was, it was there was some I mean some more movement. We you know we we kind of get more you kind of see more of the bonding going on between the crew or the fact that uh, you know the Sky's technology about now you can you know he, 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 there's a way. I mean, remember the first reboot. Um, well, the only reboot where Scotty kind of designed a way to uh, to be able to transport when a ship's at warp. Yeah. <clears throat> now see how it comes into effect into this one now, where they, that technology is stolen by the Federation, building this massive warship, piloted you know with the evil commander, you know, you know, you know paid by you know Peter Weller. <laughs> so you know that, that's, that's kind of it's always nice seeing you know him play a bad guy. Yeah. So. Any more thoughts? It was, I mean, I I enjoyed, again, seeing the characters playing the characters. Like, I enjoyed um, Kirk and Spock and, and that core cast. I actually was kind of disappointed with Benedict Cumberbatch as, as Khan. Yeah, I don't, I just feel like it, they tried to do a new take on it and, 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 and maybe add some, some yeah weird motivation that would like was not there in the original um but i yeah i don't think it worked i don't think it landed and it, it just it wasn't the same like compelling strong character that that you got in the original that con was and it it, it, it it yeah it was kind of disappointing and they made no effort to make him look Indian. I mean, even with Ricardo Montalban, um, you know, they did apply some makeup to make him look a little darker, whereas Benedict Cumberbatch was very much a British gentleman with an Indian name, which, you know, I, I you know, with, with the right actor, with the right material, I don't got problems with... I don't necessarily have a problem with somebody playing a character of a different race because, it, you know, depending on the material, it can have good results. I'm thinking of Charlton Heston in Touch of Evil, played a Mexican detective. I mean, it was Charlton Heston, but he brought something different to that role, which which I liked. Um, but I, there was just a lot that could have been done, and I think they did follow um, Wrath of Khan way too much. I think they should have just... I don't have a problem with Khan in the story, they should have just had a different story and not tried to retell Wrath of Khan. Okay, so would you, well, would you say, like, I found, like, the first 30, 20 minutes was kind of cool, the way he set things in motion. You know, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, that was kind of, that, that was kind of nice. I, it, I mean, was, it, yeah. it was, it was, but, re, but remember, we find out that Peter Weller was keeping his friends and family hostage. So how can we feel anger at a guy doing all this bad stuff when he's doing it to save other people. He's being sure, forced sure. to do what he's doing. So, he, again, the only reason we're told that Khan is a bad guy is when Nimoy makes a, a cameo near the end of the film <coughs> and relates the original crew's uh, experience with Khan. That's the only reason we're, t we're made to believe he's a bad guy. It, it's, it's, yeah, so... Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think in some things, like, you get these really two-dimensional villains who just are evil just because they're evil and that that i mean i feel like it tried to give Khan a little bit more of his own like kind of origin story about how he turned and and make it a little bit more complex than just this like god complex um yeah. but i yeah i don't think it it necessarily worked well all right, so we will move on to the third rebooted Star Trek film, Star Trek Beyond, which was co-written by Simon Pegg. 
Um, this, I, I've seen it once, and it did have, it was the first of the reboot films that did have the feel of an original Star Trek movie, but there was nothing memorable about it. If, if you know what I mean, it, it, it I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it like you know I did with Wrath of Khan or The Voyage Home. It wasn't. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean come on, now. look, you and I both know Wrath of Khan is set, you know that's that's like the Tiffany standard. We're, there's not yeah. gonna be anything close to that. <laughs> now I disagree with you with this one. I kind of like this one because it's a, I mean it it had a feel. It, it reminded me of an old TV show, you know, little voiceover. You know, what's the same thing that Enterprise has been doing for the past five years, exploring the world. So they're on a mission. So the way that that Kirk describes how what's happening with the crew, what's going on, and you know, and we, we find out more about uh, I think I've got Idris Elba's character. So we see the or you know these things happening. I kind of, it wasn't I kind of liked it, man. It was it, it's something completely different. It's it's definitely Star Trek, but something in a totally different direction. I kind of like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it kind of, um, it, it started the, you know, cause the first two films that were done, um, were very much drawing in a lot of ways on like sort of plots from the original and, and, and this one kind of, they were like, well, yeah, let's, let's take it on a, a, a journey of its own. And I did think that it was, Interesting, you know, the villains that are set up and finding out that they were originally a Star Trek crew or um, Federation crew. And and um, I think it did make the story interesting and, and kind of show like, yes, here we are, but it, it's not too far for us to go back to that kind of like primal war the bad, the indulge in our worst, worst aspects. And so I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and you know, again, I, I, I still think that the, the crew that they have for, um, just does a great job and they still did in that film. Yeah. It's unfortunate that it didn't do well, but there is a uh, hope that we're going to see a fourth film because Quentin Tarantino had an idea for a Star Trek film. And uh, they are Weird. currently in pre-production for a Quentin Tarantino-based Star Trek. <laughs> oh no! Um, <laughs> that'll be that. That'll be interesting. I'm interesting to see that. He, I, he always said he's a fan fan of that. So I'm I am curious. Well, on the right, it's if you know <clears throat> we're gonna get a real political right now. There's some you know you know Quentin right now. There's some things happening you know going on in Hollywood. Things ringing about. I'm like ah Quentin uh, right now. You kind of take take a little bit easy right now. But um, if you know, it, 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 his spin on it, I think, would be kind of fascinating with that. Well, he's been on record talking about one of his favorite episodes of uh, TNG is uh, Yesterday's Enterprise. Um, that's the one where uh, there's like a shift in time. Um, the Enterprise crew turns into like a war-based Enterprise crew. Uh, Tasha Yar comes back. Um, and then the Enterprise C, I believe, comes back from the future. And then they have to um, find a way to get the Enterprise C back into its original timeline to reset uh, everything the way it was. And, and, you know, Tasha Yar goes on the Enterprise C, which later... Um, which later you find out that, you know, that, that crew's captured by Romulans and she ends up having a, a, a Romulan daughter that uh, figures big time in the unification episode. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be interesting to see what they can, if, if that is the route they're going for this fourth one, what they can do, because they've already announced that uh, they want Chris Hemsworth as George Kirk to come back. So we'll see what they do there. Now, we are also at a time to where we have uh, some Star Trek-type shows out. We have an official one, Star Trek Discovery, which as of the recording time today uh, had its last uh, the season uh, season finale. Um, and then one I love, the Orville. Um, I have not seen Discovery. I love the Orville. Thoughts on those shows? Uh, I've only seen the first episode of the Orville still, Tim. Don't judge me, please. Oh, I, <laughs> I know, I know. I keep meaning to watch it. Um, but uh, I, I enjoyed the first episode, but it was a little bit more like Galaxy Quest-esque to me. And I know you've told me that it's, it's shifted and become a little bit more serious and really more about um, closer to Star Trek as it uh, as it kind of is not so... Um, satirical, but yeah. um, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Um, 
and and clever. Um, and then Discovery, I think I'm about halfway through at this point. And um, I... I'm enjoying it as a story, and and they are kind of sticking to the, you know, adding more diversity into it. It's uh, the first openly gay couple is is on that show, um, which is kind of nice to see, um, and you know, a very strong female lead, uh, and and it's war with the Klingons. Um, and, and so it is a little bit more, like, action, filmy sort of feeling, I feel like, than the, the originals. But it's... I'll be curious to see where they take it. Um, but it is, you know, more one continuous story. Um, and, and you get a little bit more insight into, like, the formation of the Klingon Empire, which is... I love the Klingons. I think they're, they're fascinating. Their culture is really cool. Um, so that, that's been neat to see but I'm withholding my permanent judgment for now <laughs> what about you uh, me you know dude I, I got a power the Orville I got a power wash man I remember that first the first two episodes were really incredible and I, I got a power wash to it for this the Star Trek I really haven't caught it it's it, it's I'm I'm more following the movies because I think with the movies just for me it it's it's better. I, I, I just like the fact that the stories of my are just a little more tired of that way. I just haven't had a chance to, to catch, catch, catch a new series. But, um, you know, I mean, Michelle Yeoh's in it. I'm a fan of Michelle Yeoh, so I may have to get on that. But yeah. I think for me, shows like, you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta go back. So, you know, I may have, I may rewatch, you know, Next Generation sometime when it pops on BBC. Definitely the original Star Trek it pops on. And, it, you know, even Rafa Khan. I haven't seen Rafa Khan in a hot second. So I may have to just, you know, keep it old school. Yeah. That. But I, I think there, I mean, it's more to come. You know, like I said, it's, it's, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar moneymaker owned by Paramount. So we're going to see a lot more Star Trek stuff coming out. That's yeah. Sure. Like I said, I haven't seen Discovery yet, so I got nothing to comment on there. The Orville, I love that show. Um, it's not perfect, but it's it has some gr- it has great foundations for what they can do um, for future seasons. I, what I would hope they do is kind of dial back the comedy a bit, unless it fits the scene, um, and also not be as reliant upon Star Trek uh, traditional tropes um, in terms of you know ty- the types of characters that they use. Um, if you go through uh, the, the episode, each episode of the Orville, you can find an episode, uh, some episode of Star Trek on whichever series of Star Trek that it was kind of riffing off of, like um, one uh, where they find this colonization ship of people who don't realize they're on a ship because it's been floating for a, cu- a couple of centuries and they think they're on a world and um, you know Star Trek The Next Generation did something similar like that and then just little things like that I, I think they got some building box, blocks in place to be truly successful but right now it does have that Galaxy Quest-esque feel in terms of you know we know where this came from um, the, the, yeah, it's, uh, you know, withhold judgment about, uh, Star Trek Discovery later, but I have heard that one, Star Trek Discovery has not been as successful as CBS wanted, but two, most importantly, there is work on the, the, the basically what may go down with Discovery is that they may turn Discovery into kind of like a anthology show. Mm-hmm. This season stuck with this particular story. The next season is going to be headed up by Nicholas Meyer. And if mm. the rumors turn out to be true, it's going to be a con origin story. Hmm. Whoa, that's nice. Yeah. That's there we go. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. That's, <laughs> how, you, that's how you bring us back. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully they can find out a different. Uh, I understand that CBS wants to bring eyes to the All Access app. But they need to do like other TV shows. Once this, once Discovery wraps up, give it a couple months, put it on Netflix as well so people aren't as, so they don't have to go to the CBS All Access to see one thing. You know, mm-hmm. that would be my only thing. But we're near the end. I think we should ask one more question. Cultural impact. What is the cultural impact of Star Trek? What do you think, Meredith? Um, 
the cultural impact. I mean, I, I think it really, it tries to be, you know, a step ahead of the time and in, in terms of showing, um, where we could be with our acceptance of different groups of people or different ideas. Um, and, and I think that it kind of gives, uh, a view of of a better world and 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 really like each each one has done something to advance um where humanity could be and i think that it shows that ideal and i actually read a, an article um recently about a uh, a scientist who was inspired to run for congress um because of because of Star Trek and, and growing up, she wants to bring those values to our political system because, um, like the, the pursuit of like science and fact, and, and that's been lost and how kind of it, it's, it seems like maybe in the scientific community, more people are getting interested in participating yeah. in that process. Um, and Star Trek kind of showed like the merging of science and, and politics and culture and like how that can come together. Um, and, and, create a platform that we can use to actually uh, move forward as a world. And so I, I think it also, you know, set set the tone for a lot of our technological advances, like tablets being in Star Trek. Like, and now we have tablets. Um, and uh, there have been scientists who have been working on making an actual functional replicator. And so, you know, it, it kind of, like, put these seeds of ideas in people's heads and now they're like wait how can we get there um and some of it is n not gonna happen exactly as they make it happen in star trek because it's fiction but it's not a documentary what no. <laughs> <laughs> well i think that significance of, of star trek is that Roddenberry's goal was that you, we have, we're in this together. So the fact that when the show first came on the United States and they had the diverse characters on there, that opened, that, that definitely opened my eyes to how things work in the business. And as the show progressed in terms of science, you're totally right, Meredith. We have some new inventions that's happened. You know, not, you know, thermometers now, you don't need to insert, you know, mobile devices, these, all these ideas from, from that are happening. The fact that a space shuttle was actually called the Enterprise says that, and you know how many, who knows how many scientists or or geeks, you know, got in it because of Star Star Trek, and I think that's something that that's really incredible for that, and and you know all shows like that or or, or properties go through up and down, it's just like uh, Star Wars, just like Indiana Jones, like any other things that we geek out about series, they go through up and downs, but. Star Trek was one of the, was was one of the first ones, and I think for us, it you know it, it's a gold standard in science fiction that you know we, we can think about it. We can still watch old episodes of Next Generation, and the first one that still ring true today. That's that that's pretty you know that that's that's a deep thing. That's not 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 every TV show or, or media product can do that. Where through the years, it's still relevant. It's kind of like watching most of, of the Twilight Zone. Those shows were so ahead of their time. Yeah. For me, it, it, yeah, it's it's that vision of the world. I mean, if we look at the original series with today's eyes, yeah, we can see problems um, with how women are, are are portrayed, with how minorities are portrayed. But we also do have to kind of look at it with the eyes of what it was like in the '60s as well. The fact that it was progressive, that Gene Roddenberry was a social justice warrior and doing what he did, he did it the right way. He brought pride to being a social justice warrior in terms of, you know, to, to your point, Noel, that we are all in this together. You know, we may have our differences, but at the end of the day, if, if we don't, co you know, have coalesce together as a people, we're not going to make it, you know. Um, I also think of uh, the inspiration it gave. You know, I think right now I think of a, uh, 
Cosmos, the the relaunch of Cosmos they did a few years back. Um, you know, Seth MacFarlane, of course, a big Star Trek fan, um, and also creator of the Orville was behind that. Brandon Braga, um, who was involved with the Next Generation and, and others beyond that, he was involved with Cosmos as well. And you know, Cosmos, and I'm glad they're coming with a second se- uh, season of Cosmos. They're d- uh, doing another one here, I believe, uh, next year. That is opening people's eyes about science because we are at a point to where we're so inundated with data that the right people can manipulate it and make you believe something that's not true. And we do need people to say that, you know, when it comes to science, yes, doing this long term could hurt the planet. You know, it's, it's beautiful what Star Trek can do to inspire people. But with that, I think we're all wrapped. We've wrapped up another episode. So, um, thank you all for listening. Feel free to subscribe via the podcast carrier of your choice. Thanks again, Noel, for being on the show. And Meredith, thank you. Thank you. It was yeah. fun. Any parting words, Noel? No. No, let's keep, let's keep it going and keep it geeky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it's midnight my time. I want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Live long and nope. prosper. Yeah. Keep it going and keep it geeky. You do that, which is all good. <laughs> there you go. We'll make that a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. By the time we return to the Defiant, Major Kira had discovered how to use the orb to bring us back to our own time. And that's when you return to the present? Well, not exactly. Before we left, I realized there was one last thing I had to do. Something I'd been thinking about ever since I saw that ship on the view screen. Excuse me, Captain. Here's tomorrow's duty roster for your approval. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant... Benjamin Sisko, sir. I've been on temporary assignment here. Before I leave, I just want to say... It's been an honor serving with you, sir. All right, Lieutenant, carry on. Thank you, sir. Now... If you want to put a letter of reprimand in my file for that, then go ahead. We'll have to review the case before making any recommendations. However, I don't think there was any harm done. Probably would have done the same thing myself.